All right, uh, Rick, can we hear you? Yep, let me share my screen. All right. You can hear me okay, I'm guessing? Yep, I'm here just fine. All right. And for everybody else, if you want to, uh, if you have questions for Rick, please put them in the chat and we will go through those after his uh, presentation's over. So take it away, Rick. All right, uh, so let me... I'll introduce about, yourself too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Rick Watson, uh, I have the Southern Pacific Exeter branch. I did a presentation, I don't know, six or eight months ago about how, about my operating schema and the evolution of my railroad. Uh, I'm also building a Southern Pacific in Los Angeles new layout. Um, at least right now, the plan is to have two layouts running concurrently, but the other one's slow in construction because life gets in the way. Uh, but that's that progress is going on. There's a blog link at the end of my presentation as well. I publish a monthly blog, although July and August were a little lax. Um, and so today what I'm going to talk about is the car card system that I use. Everybody's got their own preferences on car cards. And so I reached out to Eric uh, he, lo looking for presenters and his comment back was, hey, everybody's always looking for some different ways to go about doing it. So I thought I would share what I've done. Um, and this, it, the modification suits the needs of my railroad. Some of the folks that are on here on the list uh, attending today have operated on my railroad as well. Uh, so let me with that, let me get started. Um, so I'm going to cover, cover a few things is, let me ask, uh, is my drop down blocking part of the presentation? Or is it you guys only see in presentation? No, I only see the 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 slide. Okay, um, cool. I the, think it looks all right. Yeah, the Zoom meeting stuff's populating all over my screen, so I just want to make sure. So what I want to talk about are the goals of my car forwarding system, at least how I needed it for my railroad. Uh, go into the car cards, the way bills, and then uh, one layout with two railroads. How I dealt with that, and then we can open it up for any questions. Uh, so car cards and waybills. Um, this is a, essentially looks like what I'm using, uh, and I'll take you through the steps that I that got me there. Uh, I need one. My goals were to have a simple system. Um, I, not all the people that operate on my railroad or come to my railroad are experienced operators, so I want something that folks can digest and use easily. Um, I want to make again for the both the novice and the ex experienced operator. I like something similar to the old line graphics system. Um, I also should point out, I wanted everything to be computer generated and printed rather than handwritten. Um, personally, I think it's much more legible to be able to see it uh, in a printed form as opposed to handwritten. Uh, they, they should, again, they should be straightforward, obvious, uh, shouldn't be any decoding. Uh, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, I wanna use four cycle waybills. Uh, they make sure that they're easy to interpret. Uh, they're easy to change. Um, it seems to me, as I, though I decide to do some modifications and generate new waybills about every year and a half or so. Uh, so I wanted it simple, load and go, print them and cut them and get them on, deployed on the railroad. And obviously I wanted a system that was readily for, available for use. And most importantly, free is best. So with that, um, I was given an Excel based system, received it from another modeler. It's the one that went around, um, somebody in Germany had created it. And so uh, I, what I took was the original version that was given. This is a, I will apologize first because I couldn't find the original version. I, I cut it back to what I believed was the original version. And you can see you've got what the way bill number is, our, our car card number is, you've got the AAR code, the road, the number, color, uh, the name, what type of car it is, and then the return point. And then the yellow bar across is a, your printing index. Um, but what I decided is that's really inadequate for what I was wanted to do because what it left you was something that, again, if you're a novice, you're not necessarily going to know that an XM is a box car. Right. If you've been operating for a while, you do. Um, but I want to make it easy for the new folks. Uh, also, it says SP for the reporting mark, 
but every, most a lot of people look at the billboard on the car and I certainly have some cars where they're lease cars so they have different reporting marks versus what the billboard is or for example a, a reefer um, so that was where I decided I started my modeling so you know time for some modifications so what did I do uh, the first job was to make them more usable, as I said. So I started adding to it. I added what the railroad was so that billboard could be printed. I added, I, I modified the names a little bit. I added the length. Um, and then it's, it started to evolve a little bit more. I added the manufacturer, who made the car? Uh, and who made the car from a model standpoint, not the prototype? What's the weight? And then what's my shop date? And my shop process is it's adding KD couplers, it's metal wheels adjusting the weight, and then tuning the car uh, for rolling and good performance. There's a, a few things that I do along that line. Uh, and then, so moving on, then I said, oh, let me throw some comments in. So I have some reference points for myself. You can see after and five pack there that it was a, a five car set of SP box cars. And is the car card assigned? So I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of equipment that's in boxes. It's not in use. It's going to be used on the future railroad, but I've already printed the car cards for them. So I wanted to make sure those that have, I have printed the car cards, you know, I threw them in the box and then I know that those cars have cards. Uh, and then I added some additional shop dates because you've got a maintenance program and th things break. And if, it, if you have performance problems or something's breaking, something's not, uh, couplers aren't centering properly send them back to the shop and so I go through it and I want to record that just to know what's going on. So ba basically what's happened is my car card system is turned into an inventory system as well. Uh, and so I decided, well, okay, I'll, I'll continue to use that rather than have a separate inventory system. I can print my car cards right out of it. For me, it's, it's been pretty easy and straightforward. As I mentioned, the print key are the numbers across the top and that lines them up for the printer. So the changes I thought made the car cards more effective. So now, as you can see, now you've got the reporting mark, the billboard, you have the color, you have what type of cards, 40 foot box car. So if you don't know what an XN is or what a LO is, you can look on there, except I see I have an error where it says 52 foot box car, oops. Um, anyway, uh, I found that this has worked a lot better, especially for the new operators and my old, my repeat operators are pretty lazy on some of that stuff too. Um, again, talking through my, the points that I was making uh, about the different items. And then importantly is the car card number is printed on the car card. The way bill goes in front of it when it's in service, but if the car card gets damaged or you find you have incorrect information on it, having the number makes it very easy for you to reprint it. Uh, I like to, on the back side of, of the cards, I print my logo, um, just personal thing, so that when the car card is folded over, you can see it's got the logo and there is an example of two car cards. Um, you can see you've got the reporting marks, the name, color, what it is, uh, and then down here you can see the card number as well. So the growth continued. Um, I decided to add the purchase price and so I could track the values of, of everything. Uh, also from an estate planning standpoint, I've got a, it's all on a spreadsheet that my wife can use in the, in the sense of my untimely demise. I've also added tabs for locos, cabooses, vehicles, structures, etc. And then I added the box number, where are they stored? So I've got a lot of paper boxes that are full of the cars. And this is my quick reference if I need to find a car, get a car, sell a car, whatever those things are. Um, and I also printed loco and caboose cards, header cards for the, the loco and footer card for the caboose. That's a personal preference thing. I never got around to trying to modify an Excel spreadsheet to do that. So I just quite simply did it in Word, um, picked up a version of that modified it. I always include the railroad logo on there as well. Uh, you can change, uh, I have Santa Fe, I'm part of the railroad, and so I actually changed the colors at the header um, to be yellow and blue as opposed to red and gray. So now on to the way bills. Um, so it's same, another Excel based system or, or the, the same person, if you will, um, received it from another model again, time for modifications. But in this case, you can see that it prints 12 way bills on a page. 
Um, and here's a close up of the waybills. I didn't have the original version, but some of the things that I did was bolding the lettering, uh, make, trying to make it a little easier to read uh, because the waybill is an address, right? Uh, and so it's telling you to the town of Sanger, the receiver is bar packing to, the lading is empty. Uh, the, the one on the right, you can see that similar information. I did use the OPSIG industry database um, to identify places that the cars could come from. So in this case, you see Champion Products in Memphis, Tennessee. If you look on the outbound waybills, um, I also spent the time, I got the Kroger Warehouse on the right, on the left, I got the Sears and Roebuck on the right. But the trick that I put in for my operators is the via line is, is filled in. So it's a, it says Fresno, so they know that those are outbound cars. Just a little hint for them to make things a tad simpler um, as they're going through the waybills. Originally, I had it on the via line on both the inbound and the outbound, and based on some grumbling that I received, I went ahead and made the changes so that it would be on the outbound cars only. So again, for a new operator, hey, just make sure it says Fresno or it says Bakersfield, and you know that it's an outbound car. Uh, also, you, same thing with the waybills. You've got the number on the top. Um, makes it very easy to reprint. Uh, again, the waybills have reprinted a number of times. Um, a look at the new railroad or the existing, the newer version of the extra branch as it goes. Everything that you can see in black is served by only the SP. If you, everything with the green box on it is served by both the SP and the Santa Fe. So now I've got to accommodate two railroads as part of that process. So I ended up making some additional way bill changes. Um, you can see that I've, I've added a gray bar on the SP waybills, I've added a blue bar on the Santa Fe waybills. That way, because we have industries that are co-served by both railroads, which is in prototypical fashion, um, that the operators can differentiate a little bit. And then I threw some totals in here just to kind of give a, a reflection of what my car loading is uh, across the railroad. And then I decided um, about two years ago that staging was taking me way too long. And so you're either moving the orange reefer or you're moving the orange reefer. Um, so there's a lot of orange reefers on the railroad. So I didn't really see the point in trying to keep the four cycle way bill system up. So really everything's a ping pong. And my operating pool is a pool of about 30 guys. And we operate uh, basically every, twice a month. So not everybody gets to operate. I have five positions. So um, generally, if you get if the next, when you operate position one during a session, the next session you come to that position won't be available because I use a priority system. And so everybody gets a rotation of, of first pick as well. So um, the likelihood that you're going to get to know those cars, what cars are going to what industries is actually pretty small. So again, I, I'm trying to keep it as straightforward as possible as I do. The one thing I did do is I, some, some of the folks were getting done a little quickly. So now I've added specific door numbers where cars can go. Um, and I've been bitten by that a couple of times in my staging process. But if you have two cars going to the same door number, then one becomes an off spot. And there's a picture of the way bills are in action. And that's pretty much it. I wasn't, uh, there's, Again, it's pretty pretty simple, pretty straightforward, um, all Excel based, and um, the I didn't really go into how I figure out the car loading per industry and how that translates to the waybills. This is really more about the waybill and car card system as opposed to how that data gets loaded. So that's about it. So I'll turn it back to you, Eric. All right. Thanks, Rick. Um, got a few questions for you in the chat. Uh, so we'll just start with the first question. Where'd you purchase it? Oh, okay, hold on. All right. Uh, all right, they're all popping in here. All right, we'll just we'll go to the we'll go to the top. <laughs> um, Okay, somebody was asking, can you import from JMRI if you already have a roster there? 
as Drury answered, you should be able to export your cars in JMRI as a CSV, which you can then import into Excel. Yep. Um, the uh, the comment about, if you can go back, can you go back a couple slides with that show that uh, the big spreadsheet? This one. Uh, you keep going. Or the car card one, or the Waybo one. The the one with the uh, the inventory, your your inventory. Oh sure. There we go. There you go. That's, well, that's that's, a, that's locos here. Let me take you to cards. That, actually, that's that's perfectly fine. Oh, I think okay. that's the, what you've got here is actually something. I know I've been doing it, um, but you know we're all going to keel over at some point, and in many cases, our spouses are going to have to dispose of the inventory, so to speak. So I think this is something that is is certainly under under uh, promoted the idea of maintaining yeah. that inventory and saying okay look you know these are atherin blue box cars they're worth you know five ten bucks a piece uh this royal hudson here yeah this cost me 600 bucks and should be priced accordingly because yeah. my wife wouldn't know she wouldn't know any better so well that's the thing and there i know there are some guys that don't really want to expose what the values are um, oh yeah. But we, yeah we all know the peer, the the widows that the husband died somebody came in and bought the collection for a song. Right, right. right. And, and you want and it to be... You don't want them getting screwed, right? Right, right. Um, let's see, I'm just working through the questions. How do you print the waybills upside down, Brian asks? Um, Byron, sorry, Byron. <laughs> I, I pull the paper out of my printer, I flip it around, uh, and then I print it. Now, I will tell you that about 50% of the time when I'm doing a run of it, I get it wrong. <laughs> so on yeah. the car cards, I just flip it again. So you can actually go on my railroad. You see some car cards that have the SP logo on both sides of the folded yeah. side. And then on the back, the way bills, it's a little different. You print the first one and double check your orientation and then go from there. Or you cheat like I do. And I have a laser printer that will actually print both sides. But the trick is you gotta lay things out like a book. Exactly. So these two columns will print back to back. These two, these two, these two. Uh, that's how I created my my car cards using the car order system we've talked about. So. Yeah, my my laser it does do it does duplex. I just yeah, it, it's a newer it, one. And I haven't spent setup. the time. And well, I, right. I, I I try not to be in the printing business too. So right, right, right. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, where did you purchase your? Do you have a picture of your card boxes? Somebody's asking, I, where did you purchase those? I had those made. Okay. Uh, one of the local guys here had them and I copied his design. I actually went to a acrylic shop and had him make it. Oh, nice. Um, they're not cheap, but they're, they're, I think they look great. Yeah, I was gonna say something else that might work would be a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Well, no, that's, that is all molded with the plastic in the back as well, right? Right, yeah, it's got okay. a panel in the back. You might be able to use a um, a brochure stand, or like a brochure rack. Yeah. Um, like a small plastic one. I'm trying to find a picture of one. Here we go. Something like, uh, um, share this real quick. Something like this thing. Well, that's probably a little, these are a little big. That's a little big, yeah. But, but if you, um, you've, that's actually the company that I had make it, uh, made a ton of those brochure rocks as well. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's just a local, it's a local company here yeah, in Phoenix. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can share your screen again. Sure. Um, Okay, so how do you handle empty cars that haven't been assigned their next destination yet and need to just go back to the nearest yard? I thought I saw you had some cards of empty, right? I do. I do. On every car card, it's, it prints uh, when empty on the back. Um, let me go back. Yeah, actually, that was that right there. Oh, is it? No, that's the, those are the way bills. There it is. So yeah. you've got empty car return to Detroit, Michigan here. Um, honestly, I I made the provision very early on so I could do that, and I don't. I it's 
because especially now because I'm I'm just running two cycles. It's on the railroad. It's off the railroad. Yeah. Yep. So um, if I pulled the I could pull the waybills, and that would also indicate off the railroad. But then it's going to make staging more of a challenge. Um, right, right. I'm down to about an hour and 15 minutes to stage the railroad for a session, and that's about as efficient as I can get. Nice. All right. Uh, let's see. We asked to answer the question of the card boxes. Um, somewhere on your cards, you're doing via. Uh, yeah. That's on the way. Somebody is just asking to explain what that means. Yeah, the via is the yard that it, it it's representing the yard that the car is going to go to. Um, so Fresno is the next lot is the next yard that's a, or the yard that's available for the Exeter branch, also Bakersfield, and then it would go on from there. So that was the original intent. What's what is the outbound yard? Um, but I also use it as a trick for the operators to know that those are outbound cars. All right. Uh, Carl's asking, do you have outbound boxes? No, I, I, I have um, a box per industry. So there, I don't have set out pickup holds. Uh, you have to look through each industry's box to determine what's outbound. Got it. Uh, Mark made a comment, model railroad depreciates so fast, you need to hire an accountant to keep up with the values. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's really the case. I mean, I, I think a lot of the stuff appreciates. And what I've done, um, and I don't remember if you had this on your sheet, is I have the purchase, I track the purchase price and the date I bought it. Oh, I don't I don't put the date because I'm, I've am i had to go back on some of it. Well, some of it, I don't have the dates, right? Oh, yeah. I've got yeah. a lot of stuff too from before I kept track, but... Anything but I, recent, I track the purchase price and the purchase date. Just yeah. The other thing I do with that is I, um, I you know, I I track the the value and and the cost, and I do add shipping into that cost too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. It's a total purchase price. Yep. Uh, let's see. Carl suggested he made his card card boxes from wood with plexiglass fronts. That's if you could find plexiglass right now, everybody's got it up for the- Yeah, this, this is the time to buy in plexiglass. Yeah. There's gonna be a huge used plexiglass <laughs> run at some point here in the near future, so. Exactly. Uh, let's say, um, created word templates that had the second and fourth way bill upside down. Yeah, that's, um, you can get, apparently you can get wood, uh, I'm assuming they're talking about card boxes. Yeah, I think Micromark sells them. All right, and you can make card boxes out of styrene, sure. Um, Tim Rumpf asked about handling anonymous cards. Do you just swap the blank? And Tim, can you, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and finish your question? Tim Rumpf, if you're still on, can you, you got about half your question typed in there. And apparently not. Okay. So he's really anonymous. He's very anonymous. So did you mention something about anonymous cars? I didn't, I don't I did. I didn't know. I, okay. I wanted to, I, I was waiting to hear the, the elaboration on the question. Got it. Yeah. Um, I've, I figured out where my microphone button is now. Um, you, you mentioned something about not, you know, you've got bunches of orange reefers and you don't want to, mess with moving the cars around and staging um oh okay so I, okay. yeah that, so an orange reefer is an orange reefer is an orange reefer as far as being an empty going to a somewhere right well so i i guess i i i said that originally kind of flippantly originally when i was using four-part waybills i was routing the reefers to different places so that if you ran the same job two sessions in a row, you wouldn't see the same reefers. And I was running, that was originally when I was running 57 foot reefers, I was modeling 1980 and I backdated to 64, which is mostly ice reefers and it's Southern Pacific. So it's all, almost all PFE reefers. So the thought process is, is that most people don't run the same job two sessions in a row. And 
it's going to be an orange PFE reefer that they're they're dealing with. Yes, they're going to have different car numbers, but if it's the same car number that they see two sessions in a row, it's likely they're not, or they likely won't see that. They likely won't remember that. It was more about, so all my reefers are uh, for every session, empties in, loads out. Um, in the prototype practice, this was really one job. They would come in with a hundred car reefer block of, of pre-cooled uh, and iced reefers overnight, drop them off and pick up well over a hundred loads and take them back. But that was one crew that did that, which won't keep four, you know, four or five operators busy. But yeah, I, I still, all my reefers, the outbound reefers all go to staging, the bills get flipped. Um, and then I actually do some balancing of the bills because I don't, I, I try not to send, if they all came from, you know, um, uh, bar packing, uh, which is in Sanger, they came from bar packing one. Well, I don't want to flip them and have all the bar ca packing cars blocked next to each other. So I randomized the way bills on the inbound cars as part of the staging process, which you could argue that that's not prototypically correct, but otherwise my operators would get done too fast. Yeah. I was going to say the other way I've, I've seen people do that, I'm sure you've seen is you have blocks of cars, you know, like five cars together and you do one way bill for the, the string. Uh, um, Jeff Otto and his and his massive war trains, there's like one card per, I think he does five cars. So it's a little bit easier, a little bit less paperwork to deal with. Right. So, but yeah, well when the in the you know when the railroad has got that hundred car block of ice reefers and somebody's got to take it and distribute it to the packing houses. Yep. yep. You know, it's okay. I need 15 reefers for this job. Okay. I don't really care which one. I just take need the first 15 them. reefers. Right. Make sure there's no defective cars there. Off you go. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, that's the, where I deviate from prototype practice just for an operational interest. All right. One last question that we'll, we'll move on. Um, Bert, Bert saying, are you saying that during staging, you swap waybills around instead of reblocking the trains? Yes, it's faster. Okay. All righty. Well, you got uh, my email. If you got, if you have more questions, we can go into that. <laughs> got it. Well, Rick, thanks for thanks so much for presenting. We appreciate the the update. Um, if you have questions for Rick, um, if you can drop your email into the chat, um, that way I don't have to put it up on the uh, uh, public page. Yeah, I'll pop it in there. All righty. Thing here. All right, um, appreciate everybody's questions. Uh, next up is Bruce Morton. So we're gonna spotlight Bruce here and turn off the thing. And there you go. Should be good to go, Bruce. I've still got the unmute thing in my face. So, um, I did a presentation a while ago on, on direct traffic control. Um, and I was in the process of, of putting it into the chat. Um, it's on the YouTube channel for uh, the OPSIG. So you can go see that. And what I was gonna talk about today was uh, CTC. And I don't, uh, I don't use CTC on my own layout but I manage a very large layout that does use CTC. And so that's basically what we're gonna talk about today. Um, most of the railroads that went to CTC did so because you can push through a lot more traffic. Um, you don't have the discussions between the crews and the dispatcher. The dispatcher basically makes the decision for the crew He's managing all the traffic and making sure that it flows smoothly and quickly. Uh, and the crew only has to look at the signals and see whether it's a 
red light or a green light um, or a yellow light and they take the sightings when necessary and the signals tell them when to do that. So you get away from any kind of priority on the trains. So there's really no first class or second class or extra trains. Everybody's handled the same. The dispatcher just makes them go across the layout. So what, what we have is a, a union switch and signal company um, CTC panel that was actually in use on the Southern Pacific. It was modified by Rod Loader so that it was, it was modified for the particular model railroad by Rod Loader. And so all the stations on the layout or on the panel. And so we just run it just like a regular railroad. And it works pretty well. Um, we started operating a couple months ago for the first time since March of 2019. And I, I'm sorry, but I'm really rusty. I ended up being the dispatcher uh, for our September session. And boy, that it's tougher than I remember. <laughs> it was like, okay, I, I know how to do this, but it took me about five minutes until I got my feet on the ground. And I managed to get through the whole process um, to the end, almost without any problems at all. At the very end, I, I set up a, a head on and I didn't even think we could do that. Usually CTC has logic in it that will not allow you to do that. It'll knock down the signals. But what I have is a, um, is a video. So what I'm gonna do is try and show the video to you. And um, then you can ask questions later. Um, can we see the first slide? Yeah, I can see it. Go ahead and hit play. Okay. Let's see how it, it should does. should be good. So basically what we're gonna see is a, an overview of the layout first. And then um, a little discussion about Siegel, how it works. L and M Eastern Kentucky Division models an imaginary southern extension of the prototype Eastern Kentucky Division. It's an operations-oriented railroad. The railroad was on the NMRA tour for the Long Beach National Convention in 1996 and the Anaheim Convention in 2008. It has been featured in Model Railroader, Railroad Model Craftsman, and Rail Model Journal. The layout models from ha Hazard in the north to Ashland in the south, with interchanges with the Norfolk and Western through Norton, Virginia, the Kentucky Northern at Harlan Junction, Kentucky, the Chesapeake in Ohio at Dean, Kentucky, and the LNS Cumberland Valley South to Corbin, Kentucky. What you're seeing now is the large Ashland yard at the southern end of the layout. And this is Bishop's Church, a small industrial area just adjacent to Ashland. The Eastern Kentucky Division models an area of coal mines in the Appalachians in Eastern Kentucky and in Western Virginia. The year is 1971. So both first and second generation diesels are the rule. Operation focuses on coal traffic both on and off the line with mines and coal processing industries distributed in the mountainous Appalachian scenery. Here you can see a, a large uh, viaduct. This is, uh, we call it the Powell Creek Viaduct, but it's modeled after the Copper Creek Viaduct just south of Appalachia. The Eastern Kentucky is still running its own passenger train. The 1,500 square foot HO scale layout is fully scenic. Crew staff yards at Ashland, Fowler, Dent, and Hazard. Road crews are responsible for mine runs, empty and full coal trains, hot freights, forwarders, local freights, and an occasional passenger train. For the CTC session, communication to the dispatcher is via FRS radios. We use a three to one fast clock 
which moves the action along. Car cards and waybills are used to direct car forwarding. And control is DCC using CVP's Easy DCC wireless and wired throttles. Smart phone throttle apps can also be utilized as controls. Here we see the interchange with the Kentucky Northern at Harlan Junction. We've moved into the coal country and you can see uh, one of the coal temples here at Island Springs. And we'll come back to Island Springs because one of the trains here is the one we'll use as an example as we do the, the demonstration of the CTC machine. Centralized Traffic Control, or CTC, allows the dispatcher to control signals and switches along a designated territory from a single control panel, not necessarily near the area covered. Under CTC, all trains are of equal status, so there are no first class, second class, third class, or extra trains. Also, there are no written documents authorizing movement like train orders, track warrants, or DTC block authorities. The prototype LNN put in its first CTC um, in 1943, and the Eastern Kentucky had CTC by early 1949. The CTC board was located in company offices in Ravenna, Kentucky. The LNN Eastern Kentucky Division CTC board here that you see was originally built for the Southern Pacific for use on in Roseburg, Oregon. It's a union switch and signal machine, and it was rebuilt for the Eastern Kentucky Division by Rod Loader. CTC is implemented from the north switch of Clements to the north switch of Viper. Switch locks are not yet implemented. Handheld radios are used for communication between the dispatcher and the road crews. While a telephone is used for yardmaster to dispatch conversations. Trains are identified using post-it notes while on the railroad. In the real railroad, they would use a, a train sheet. And we do have train sheets that we do use occasionally. For this video, we will set up a meet between two trains at Glenbrook. So extra 109 South with two RS3s is a returning mine run at Island Springs with a destination of Glenbrook. It's been holding short of the roadway here at Island Springs to let traffic go through, but it's just delivered the empty hoppers to the coal tipple at Island Springs, picked up the loaded hoppers, to take back to the marshalling yard. It needs to use the main to access the Fowler Coal Yard. Train 164 with lead locomotive 1229 and ST40 is the afternoon freight forwarder. It's moving across the Powell Creek Viaduct toward Eldridge Camp. Its final destination is Hazard. However, the first it has to do some work in Dent. So we'll follow this train along as we set the CTC. We'll set the Eldridge Camp train 164 to go into the siding at Glenbrook. So first we'll move switch 27 lever to reverse, and then signal 28 lever to the right so the train can proceed north. 
Next, we'll make sure that switch 29 lever is set to normal and signal 30 lever is set to the left so that the mine run can proceed south. Once these levers are set up correctly, then we can press the code buttons and send the instructions to the railroad. Here is signal 28 and switch 27 at South Glenbrook. Watch as the switch moves and the signal changes when the code button on the CTC panel is pressed. So signal 30 at North Glenbrook changes when the code button on the CTC panel is pressed. Now we can set the switch and signals between each train's destination and their current location, working from the destination back toward the trains. Make sure the lev switch levers are set for normal and the signal levers are set for the appropriate direction. Then press each code button. You'll notice that it takes a little bit of time before the lights come on the panel while the machine works. So the switches are then lined for the main to the siding, and the signal aspect changes on the dwarf signal at South Island Springs. When extra 109 south gets to the next signal, you'll see a yellow over red signal. And it changes as they pass. As each train proceeds, the CTC panel shows their progress. A light will illuminate when a train is in the block. Once each train enters the interlocking and the locomotives pass the signals, the signals are knocked down to red. And you'll notice that change on the panel as the train goes through the interlocking. So train 164 is approaching the north switch at Eldridge Camp, and you'll watch on the panel as it goes through the OS, the signals will be knocked down. Just like that. So here's train 164 coming down the grade into Glenbrook. You can see the Fowler marshalling yard, coal marshalling yard in the foreground. Train 164 will see a red over yellow signal indication showing the turnout lines for the siding. As it goes through, it will knock down the signal. The following trains will have a red over red. So down the track, the mine run has already arrived and is holding the main. You can now set a route for 
train 164 to continue to dent. Work in dent is done from the siding, so we'll set switch 49 to reverse and signal 50 to north or the right. This can then be coded. We'll confirm the switches from dent through Kyle's Ford and Island Springs, again working from the destination to the current location of the train on the siding at Glenbrook. And make sure that the switches are normal and then set the signals for northward and code each one. Finally, we'll change switch 29 to reverse to allow train 164 to enter the main and set signal 38 to northward and code this. So as train 164 leaves Glenbrook, it's got a green on the dwarf, means it can exit the siding and retake the main. So there you have it. The two trains have safely passed each other and have reached or are on their way to their destination. We hope you have not only enjoyed this video, but learned a little bit about operation under centralized traffic control. So Eric, are you gonna handle the questions or you want me to look back through the chat? Sure, I'll, I'll go through there. Um, and for the record, I don't care. If it, signals are the coolest thing when they're, when they're working right. Um, there's a couple layouts. Uh, one in particular, um, Mike Burgett up in the Detroit area has a massive CTC machine that he got from, actually he's got several of them now and that's, it's impressive to see him when they, you have to push the little thing to make him ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. <laughs> he has all so, of that working too. But so just a comment. Um, when Rod Rod was doing the the conversions of the CTC machines, he got tired of doing that, and he basically sold his business to Mike. Oh so really? Mike took, Mike took over Rod's business. Oh, that's funny. That's yeah, funny. and then. My understanding is that Mike's not really doing it anymore. He's handed over to somebody else. Got it. So all right. So yeah, Mike's Mike's a real expert at CTC. Yeah. Also. Well, he's a signal maintainer for. I think he works for CN, so mm -hmm. he he does it full time. But yeah. Um. The only question there was a question about what was the mirror next to the tipple. Oh uh, yeah. And it looks like it was just to see be able to see the signals that aren't visible from the aisles. That's exactly right. We. The signal is there, but it's facing the tunnel and that you can't really see there. Yep. That space is very tight because the um, the yard master at the Fowler marshalling yard is in that space. And we actually have a, a bulletin out that says uh, engineers are not allowed in that space because it's just too tight without yep. permission from the yard master. So we set the mirror up so that you don't have to get into that space and you can look down the track, see what signal you have, and then proceed as, as indicated. Got it. Um, yeah, the other way I've seen that done is you basically put a repeater out on the panel to basically say, okay, this is the signal, you know, 
further in. Um, oh, Alan Bell has an. I saw his, I don't know if he still got his layout, but he had an amazing layout back years ago. It was part of the Three Rivers Ops. Uh, it was a uh, New York Central, but his was really, it was almost a European style railroad because it was more focused on just stations, getting trains into stations, out of stations. Um, so uh, it's I'm glad to see he's still doing that. But. Yeah, and I think, I think Alan's selling all the parts still um they're plastic uh recreations of actual ctc levers and and so you can put together a panel just like what what was in the video yeah um okay so there's one other question um asking about the dwarf signals um well there's two questions what was the purpose and the dwarfs leaving the sightings only display green and red so can you talk a little bit about the dwarf signals there? So the dwarf signals were, uh, that was typical of coming out of a siding. Um, and, and it's just green or red because you're stuck there. If you're in the siding, you're not gonna go anywhere until the dispatcher says to go. Uh, we don't have them set up logically to, to do yellow. If you are gonna run a train through the siding, uh, they'll come in, on one end with a yellow going into the siding. <laughs> that train was moving too fast, by the way. It should be running at restricted speed through the siding. But once you get to the other end, if they just want to run you through, you'll have a green on the other end. You just run out. And I hope that helps. Uh, somebody asking about where are you, what are you using for turnout motors? There's switch masters. OK. All right. Most of the layout is set up with uh, with Bruce Chubb's uh, CMRI. We okay. run the, the CMRI um, in, in we use JMRI and Logic for the, the back end that runs the CTC panel. Um, we have some proprietary boards that we're using instead of Bruce's in terms of the signal drivers and the detection, but it's it's very similar to the stuff you could buy from them. Okay. All right, and there's a comment in here. They can display yellow, however, because you set the destination signals first, the dwarfs displayed green from red, so. And since Matthew is the dispatcher in the, in the video, he knows well, he's a yep. better dispatcher than I am. Yeah, those panels are, uh, I got to use the one at, um, uh, for a little bit at, uh, well, I don't know if he had the, I, he actually did um, on, uh, oh, shoot, what's his name? Uh, it's where part of the V at the Virginia and Ohio still lives. Um, uh, Jerry Albers yeah. on his layout. So. Okay, well, looks like that's all the questions. So Bruce, thanks for, thanks for sharing and uh, explaining that. Like I said, the, the idea of having working signals, um, if you're building a layout, it's something you need to kind of think about from the beginning. Because um, in order to get the signals on, you got to have the detection working. And if you don't do the detection at the beginning, it's a real pain to put in after the fact. Yeah, tell me and about yeah, what, that. Uh, uh, John Hansky says same thing as me um, using JMRI for that that signaling and you can actually make it look like a CTC panel with the graphics and so on. Um, sure. uh, Dennis is asking about uh, a link to the YouTube video. The I, I can post a link to the video itself, but I think Eric's going to post a, a link to uh, this this recording too so yeah i'll put this i'll put this up and then you'll have the whole thing dennis yeah so, um, i should put it but I they may want it. they may want the original one if it's if it was jumping there were a couple of places that jumped a little bit but that's yeah. what you get for streaming in a stream so I, i'll post the original also uh i'll plug dennis as long as he's on because i'm putting his system in but it's an abs system but dennis does some really good signal work if you need somebody to help you with your signals. 
uh, he's probably a good person to talk to. Yep. And then I'll, I don't know. And I think Seth is on, they have a, uh, signals are probably one of the most expensive things you could buy, but, uh, the, the company that Seth Newman has, um, uh, Motor Motor Railroad, Railroad Control System. Yeah, they actually have a like a dollar signal that you can use. They're they're very oh, yeah. um, functional. Well, I guess they're, they're a little bit more expensive than that. But um, uh, looks like uh, there we go. I'll just share this. This is probably what I'm going to use for for starters because signals are really expensive. But these you basically get. 12 of them on a board um, with the, you know, green, yellow, red, the positive. So you can very quickly hook those up and have very basic signals running for a dot, basically what, a buck, buck and a quarter a piece, something like that, if my math's right. So uh, now granted, you've still got to get the signal logic boards and all that, or, well, the, the logic, you know, there are signal logic boards, but, um, uh, you know, whether you're using Digitrax or CMRI, I'm using RR circuit stuff. It's putting it, putting in signals is it's a, <laughs> uh, it's a labor of love and money from what I can tell. So, but all right, well, uh, I'll stop the share here. Um, I'll open it up for questions. Um, but otherwise, um, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording.